Go ahead and turn over to John chapter 3. That's where we'll be this morning. John chapter 3. John chapter 3 and verse 16 is probably the most famous Bible passage in the entire world. The only other passage I can think of that would come close is Psalm 23. But I think John 3.16 is even more famous. That, that would be my guess. And for good reason. It is a powerful passage. It is the powerful words of Jesus. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whosoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That's a passage that I can say from memory. Uh, I don't have a lot of passages memorized, but that one's pretty easy to, to say from memory. And I bet you could say it too. A lot of people can say it. Even people who are not Christians can probably say it. It's a powerful passage. But maybe one thing that we don't think about when we quote that passage is its context. And I think the context... Uh, of course, is always important, but for, for this passage, when we understand the context, maybe gets us to think about Jesus' words a little bit differently. At least that's what I thought as I studied this passage. And so let's talk about this passage just a little bit. In John chapter 3, in the first eight verses, which we will not read, Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night. And he makes a concession. He is a, a Pharisee, a ruler of the Jews. And he makes a concession that I don't think many of the Pharisees were willing to make in front of Jesus. But Nicodemus does. He says, we see or we know that you are from God. No one can do the signs that you do without being from God. And so he makes this concession. But he doesn't understand he doesn't understand what Jesus is about, and he's seeking more information. And as Jesus teaches him, it becomes clear that there's a lot that Nicodemus does not understand. Jesus teaches him that you have to be born again to enter the kingdom of God. And Nicodemus says, how can someone be born again? Jesus says, explains that in order to be born again, you must be born of the Spirit. And Nicodemus asks, well, how, how can someone be born of the Spirit? And so Nicodemus is lacking in understanding, and Jesus essentially starts telling him that he's not ready to know these things that Jesus is teaching. And that's where we pick up in verse 9. Start reading with me in John chapter 3 and verse 9. Nicodemus said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? Truly, truly, I say to you, we speak of what we know and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. If I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven. But he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light, and does not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. 
So we read this passage, and now I want to break it down further than just reading it. In verses 9 through 12, we have highlighted Nicodemus's lack of understanding. And what is highlighted is first that he is supposed to be a teacher of Israel. Jesus said, you are a teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things. Well, over in Matthew chapter 23, Matthew chapter 23 And look at verse 2. This is Jesus talking about the Pharisees. And notice what he says about them. He says, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in the chair of Moses. Or some translations say, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in the seat of Moses. Moses was a teacher of the law and also had authority over the people to interpret the law. And whether or not they were given that by God, the Pharisees had at least seated themselves in the chair of Moses. They were teachers of the law. They were interpreters of the law. They were to guide the people. And Jesus, understanding that that's how they saw themselves and how the people saw them. He says, you're supposed to be a teacher of Israel, Nicodemus, and yet you don't understand the things that I'm telling you? Jesus holds Nicodemus to a high standard. I'm reminded of what James says in James chapter 3 and verse 1. The book of James chapter 3 And verse 1, where James says, Let not many, many of you become teachers, my brethren, knowing that as such we will incur a stricter judgment. So Jesus is being hard on Nicodemus, but it's because he sees himself as a teacher. Teachers incur stricter judgment because, as James goes on to say in chapter 3, Many people, all people, stumble in word. And you're supposed to be leading people, Nicodemus. You ought to know these things. And so Jesus scolds him for that. But then he talks about, he says, we speak of what we know. And then he says, and testify of what we have seen, and you do not accept our testimony. Jesus, usually in this chapter, will talk about his teaching and say, I did this, I did that. But here he says, we. Who's we? Based on the context, and based on what I know about the ministry of Jesus, my best guess is John the Baptist. John the Baptist was to prepare the way uh, of Jesus beforehand. John the Baptist had interactions with the Pharisees and the Pharisees with him. They heard his teaching. And so John the Baptist testified that someone was was coming after him and that was Jesus. And and John was preparing the way into the kingdom. And that's what Jesus is preaching here about the kingdom. And so I think the we is there. Jesus is saying, John the Baptist and I have spoken. We speak of what we know and testify about what we've seen. And you do not accept our testimony. They didn't accept John the Baptist. They don't accept Jesus. The Pharisees do not. So Jesus is chiding them for that. But Jesus is also emphasizing his witness here. He's not speaking of things that he is theorizing about. He's not speaking of things that he has heard about. But he's speaking about what he knows. And he's speaking about what he has seen. He's testifying about what he's seen. And so there's a a down to earth approach that Jesus is taking. And he says, 
I've told you the earthly things. He says, if I told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? Jesus is saying, I've kept it real simple for you, Nicodemus. I've told you things that should be easy to understand, earthly things. And if you want to know how, how somebody can be born of the Spirit, well, that's, that's more complicated. That's a heavenly thing. And if you don't believe when I tell you earthly things, how, how are you going to believe when I start telling you heavenly things, Nicodemus? And so one thing we learn is that Jesus' ministry so far, and, and I'd say most of his earthly ministry, stays rather simple. It stays on, on things that are earthly, so to speak. And then you look at John chapter 16. Jesus is talking to his disciples. People who, who have been with him for three years, day in, day out, for the most part. And notice what Jesus says in John chapter 16 and verse 12. He says, I have many more things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Even his disciples were struggling with the things that Jesus said, and he had more to teach them, but they weren't ready yet. Nor was Nicodemus ready. And so Jesus said, you're, you're not ready for this. You don't have understanding. But then Jesus almost changes subject, at least it seems. But I think it, as we will continue to read and continue to understand, I think it does tie in. In verses 13 and 14, I've labeled this section up and down because Jesus is making plays on, on, on those directions. He says, no one has ascended into heaven. Well, if you break down the, the word ascended, literally it means go up. No one has gone up into heaven, but he who has come down from heaven, the Son of Man. He just, he's descended. He's come down. And so there's a, a play on up and down. But then even further, he says in verse 14, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. So there's this play. And honestly, I'm not 100% sure why Jesus is doing this. Perhaps it is uh, a, a thought of the, the pedestal that the Pharisees put themselves up on. And Jesus is saying, no, you haven't gone up into heaven. Only the Son of Man has done that, but the Son of Man has come down so that He may be lifted up. And of course, we understand that Jesus is talking about the cross there and Though he was lifted up, it was not a matter of pride. Rather, it was in him humbling himself that he was lifted up on the cross. But Jesus uses imagery of the bronze serpent in Numbers chapter 21. Turn with me over there. Numbers chapter 21. And start reading with me in verse 4. This is talking about the children of Israel. It says in verse 4 of Numbers 21, Then they set out from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against God and Moses, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water. And we loathe this miserable food. The Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, so that many people of Israel died. So the people came to Moses and said, We have sinned because we have spoken against the Lord and you. Intercede with the Lord that he may remove the serpents from us. And Moses interceded for the people. Then the Lord said to Moses, Make a fiery serpent and set it on a standard. 
And it shall come about that everyone who is bitten, when he looks at it, he will live. And Moses made a bronze serpent and set it on the standard. And it came about that if a serpent bit any man, when he looked to the bronze serpent, he lived. And so this is the context of what Jesus is talking about. The bronze serpent being lifted up. And we see three things here that happen. Number one, the people sinned. They complained against God and said that He's brought them out of Egypt to die, which was not true. He promised that He would bring them into the land. And they knew that. They also complained that they had no food and no water. But then they go on to say they have food, but they said they loathe this miserable food. Well... The scriptures call manna the, the food of angels. And that it, its taste was, was like, like honey. And it, it was sweet to the taste. And yet here they say, they're saying, oh, this food is awful. We hate it. And so they complain against God and they sin. And God punishes the people. But then... The people say we sin and they want Moses to intercede. And so Moses intercedes for them and God tells him to what he's to do. He's to make this serpent, this bronze image of one of these fiery serpents that was sent among the people, a venomous serpent that was biting the people and they, they died. But he said, make a bronze version of this and lift it up. And whoever looks upon this serpent, looks to it, will live. So you need to believe and live. I take it, based on the context, based on what Jesus is saying here, but also what happens in Numbers 21, that it wasn't just an incidental looking at the serpent. Here you're bit by a serpent and all of a sudden you look up, oh, there's a bronze serpent. Well, now I'm cured. No, it's not an incidental looking, but when this serpent comes upon you and bites you, you're to seek out the bronze serpent and look at it so that you may live. We'll talk more about that in just a moment. And then we get into, of course, the most well-known part of this passage. In verse 14, he said, Even so, the Son of Man must be lifted up. Verse 15, So that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. And then, of course, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. When we talk about this, Comparing it to the bronze serpent, it follows the same pattern. When it talks about God so loved the world, implicit in that is that the world sinned. Just like the people of Israel had sinned against God, so the world, all of us, have sinned against God. And, but God loved the world. And you notice when, when we talk about the bronze serpent, I said that Moses interceded for the people. Well, who, who is doing the intercession here? Well, Jesus tells us it's God. God so loved the world. He interceded. And He lifted up, or will, in, in the case of Jesus as He's talking, will lift up His Son. Moses interceded. God told him to lift up a bronze serpent. God interceded and is lifting up His own Son. That whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Believe and live. Again, this... Bronze serpent, looking at it, I don't think it was an incidental thing that if you just looked up and happened to see the serpent that you were healed, you had to believe that you had, you had to look and seek out the bronze serpent. In the same way, someone who is dying from sin 
who is needing redemption needs to look to Jesus who was lifted up and believe in Him and they will have eternal life. They will live. It's the same pattern that Jesus is using here to talk about Himself. But another thing that I want to bring out in verse 18 is that he, he places an emphasis on the present. And this is where I think perhaps the, when, when we just quote this verse out of context, we lose the context. I don't mean to, to sound ungrateful or anything of that sort. But when we quote John 3.16, what, what is the emphasis on typically? To, to me, the emphasis is on God. God so loved the world. And amen to that. Absolutely, God deserves the credit. God's love is, is great. It's wonderful. And, and Jesus dying on the cross, that's a great sacrifice. But I think the emphasis that Jesus is placing in this context is on the latter part is on whoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have eternal life. And then he goes on to talk about this belief. He who believes in Him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already. There's this emphasis on the present. Nicodemus, you need to believe in Jesus, not when He's lifted up. Certainly, yes, when He's lifted up. But you need to believe in Jesus now. He who believes in Him, not he who will believe in Him. He who believes in Him is not judged, but he who does not believe has been judged already. That's something that has happened in the past and is happening now. Nicodemus, you've been judged already because you don't believe in Jesus. And there's reason enough to believe in Him right now. And that's Nicodemus says the Pharisees' whole problem is they refuse to believe in Jesus. Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night because he doesn't want everybody to know that he's going to see Jesus because he's a Pharisee. And if people knew that Nicodemus was, was coming to Jesus to, to find out what he's talking about, Nicodemus could be ruined. He's unwilling to show whatever belief that he does have in Jesus. And then in verse 19, Jesus talks about the judgment or the condemnation. He says, this is the judgment or the condemnation. That the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light. That light and darkness that he talks about all throughout verses 19 through 21. Remember what I just said. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. And yes, there's a, a literal way to take that. Of course, he, he, the idea is that he didn't want everybody else to find out. But the imagery that's used in John portrays two other things about Nicodemus. One, that he was darkened in his understanding. Yes, that he did not have the light of, of the knowledge of Jesus like he should have. But darkness throughout the book of John and throughout the epistles of John is used as a figure for sin. Is used as a figure of not just being unknowledgeable, but not wanting to know. And that's what Jesus is saying here. 
the light has come into the world. But men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. They don't want to see the light. They don't want to know what there is to know. Because they love what they're doing, their evil deeds. They love doing what's wrong. And Jesus is drawing a parallel here that we can't ignore. If we love the darkness, if we love living in sin, that's equal to not believing in Jesus. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. That's Nicodemus. He doesn't want to come to Jesus. He doesn't want to fully believe in Jesus because... His deeds are evil. And he doesn't want to be exposed. He's afraid of being exposed. And that's why Jesus is telling him what he's telling him. That's what John 3.16 is all about. In the context, I recognize that it has much more meaning than, than just the immediate context. Jesus is saying, Nicodemus... You don't have the understanding that you should. You love the darkness rather than the light. And therefore you don't believe in me. But you need to believe in me. Because whoever believes in Jesus will have eternal life. But John chapter 3 does not end there. Yes, the, the conversation with Nicodemus is over, but there's some other things that happen that kind of, I think, illuminate John 3.16 even more. For time's sake, we won't read verses 22 through 36. We'll just sum it up. But Jesus is baptizing and spending some time in the Ju Judea and He's ministering and He's baptizing people. But John the Baptist is still active at this time. He has not been imprisoned yet. And He's baptizing in Enon near Salem. And His disciples come to Him and they say, you know, John, we, we've heard about Jesus and, and He's baptizing people. And the implication is, don't, don't you have a problem with that, John? Aren't you going to go stop him? Like, that, that's your thing, John. He, he's baptizing people, but what about you? And John's response is very telling. And I think it's something that we can learn from. Something that we can even apply to us today. Again, just summing up what John says, not reading it. But one thing that John says is, I told you, you heard it from me, that I'm not the Christ. He says that in verse 28. <clears throat> he says, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent ahead of him. And the implication there is, yeah, John's not the Christ, but there's somebody who is. And that John was sent ahead of him. He's pointing to Jesus. He's saying that Jesus is the Christ. And that's what he says in verse 30 when he says, He must increase, I must decrease. I've come to point the way to Him. And now He's here. He's ministering. My time is coming to an end. His time is beginning. And so he must increase, I must decrease. And then John says something very similar to what Jesus said in John 
When in verse 36 he says, He who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life, but the wrath of God abides in him. And by the way, some of your translations may say, believe there on the second part of that, but he who does not believe the Son will not be, see life. Well, in the Greek, the, from the manuscripts, that word is obey. It's not believe, it's obey. And those are two different words. So the proper translation is, he who believes in the Son has eternal life, but he who does not obey the Son will not see life. And so John kind of helps us illuminate what believing is, that it's not just an intellectual belief, but it's obedience. And so I said John's response is something for us to ponder, something for us to think about. And as we close this morning, I want you to think about what John said. John said that he was not the Christ. But he pointed to Jesus and said that he was the Christ. Well, that's something that we should understand as well. That Jesus is the Christ. Christ is the, the Greek word for Messiah, which means anointed one. He is the one who was promised to, to bring in God's kingdom and to, and to reign on David's throne forever. We had a lesson about that not too long ago, about how Jesus fulfills the Old Testament. <coughs> Jesus is the Christ. He is the Son of God. That is the foundation of the Gospel. But as John said, he must increase, I must decrease. We need to take those words and we need to apply them to our lives. Because Jesus didn't stop increasing on the day that he died on the cross or even the day that he was resurrected or the day that he ascended. I submit to you that Jesus continues to increase to this day and will continue to increase until the day that He returns because we must decrease. There are still others who need to know about Jesus Christ and they must decrease as well so that Jesus must increase. We sing a song called None of Self and All of Thee. And at the beginning of that song, the first verse talks about how we were so prideful and we said to ourselves, all of self and none of thee, none of Jesus. And then the next verse says, some of self, but okay, some of Jesus. And then the next verse is, even less of ourselves and more of Jesus. But we're all hoping to get to that last verse. We all want to submit our lives to Jesus and say truly in our hearts, none of self and all of Jesus. He must increase. I must decrease. And we need to believe in Jesus. But not just intellectually say, okay, I believe that He's the Son of God. But let that take root in our lives. Every aspect, every facet of our lives and render our <coughs> obedience to Him. Because if He is the Christ, then He's King. If He is the Christ, He's Lord of Lords. And so we must submit ourselves to Him. He who believes in the Son has eternal life. We have that promise of eternal life if we will believe in Him. Yes. But if we do not believe, if we do not obey the Son, then we will not see life.
Where do you stand this morning? Are you like Nicodemus? Blinded by, as we talked about this morning in 2 Corinthians 4, the God of this world? Unwilling to see the light because you love the darkness? If you haven't obeyed the Gospel, that's where you are. And Jesus invites you to come to the light. Come to the glory that is shown in Him in the Gospel. Believe in Jesus Christ, that He is the Son of God, and that He died on the cross for your sins, and that He was raised on the third day and now reigns at the right hand of the throne of God. Repent of your sins. Turn away from a life of sin. Turn to Jesus. Confess His name before men and be baptized for the remission of sins and live faithfully to Him. If you're not a Christian, that opportunity is for you this morning. If you are a Christian and perhaps you have not been living in the light but have turned back to the darkness, know that Jesus died for your sins, is a propitiation for your sins, and is willing to forgive you if you will confess your sins. If you have any need this morning, won't you come while we stand and sing?